In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for giving us once again another beautiful day in our life. Thank you, Father, for the gift of life itself. Thank you most of all for the privilege that you give us each day to come in your presence, the each day to listen to your voice. And most of all, Lord God, as we begin to understand the secrets of your kingdom, as we begin to get those revelations of all that you want to teach us, helping us, assisting us through the Holy Spirit to walk this life in victory, to walk this life as your disciples, and most importantly, Lord, to advance your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we have been on a journey in the last few days, learning how to plant the seed as disciples in your kingdom. We have learned so far about the three soils on which that incorruptible seed of your word fell and it was not able to bear the fruit that endured, a fruit that would last, a fruit that would bring eternal life to those whom you have ordained for. Lord, at this very moment, as we come to the fourth seed today, or come to the fourth soil, the same seed falling on different soils, today, Lord, give us understanding of the word. Make our hearts fertile soil. Let the seed of your word germinate on our hearts, on the soil of our hearts, so that, Lord, not only can we receive victory, not only can we live in the abundant life, but, Lord, that we can be used by you, we can be usable to the kingdom to make disciples and to advance your kingdom here on earth. At this very moment, Spirit of God, take complete control of this class. This is your class, O Holy Spirit. This is the class of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, Spirit of God, anoint each one of us. Anoint my heart, my lips, my vocal cords, my tongue. As I share the word, nothing of me, everything of you. And Lord, as this word is spoken, as this message goes out, let this word bring the harvest of your kingdom in every hearer of the word. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, my brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. Today we are just going to continue with what we have already started in the last two weeks, and that is a journey of a disciple. And in the last five days, we have been studying about planting the seed of of the word of God and we saw that just as the sow went out to sow the seed, this seed fell on different soils. It fell along the pathway, it fell along the rocky ground, it fell as we saw yesterday among thorns and bushes. And now my brothers and sisters, today we are going to talk about the fourth soil and we shall see what this soil is all about and how we are all able to bear the fruit of the kingdom when we have planted the word in this particular soil. Now, brothers and sisters, before we go to the fourth soil, let us quickly summarize our journey so far and what it takes for us to bear the harvest of the kingdom of God. As you know, we have seen in the, in, in, the, in the first soil, the first soil was the one where the sow sowed the seed, it fell along the pathway. And when it fell along the pathway, what happened? The birds of the air came and picked up those seeds and as a result, there was no germination. The soil, it never penetrated the soil and there was no harvest. And this pathway or this soil represents a heart which has not received understanding of the word. And so when we do not understand the word, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word, and as a result, the word of God does not bear the fruit in our lives. The second soil that we saw was 
it was a rocky ground. And again, brothers and sisters, because it was rocky ground, there was no space for the seed to grow from underneath the soil. The, 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 the soil, I mean the plant immediately sprung up from the top and having no proper root system, this plant immediately withered because of the scorching sun, because of the strong winds, because the root system wasn't very strong for the plant to withstand all those harsh conditions. And this soil represents somebody who is, you know, affected by offense. When people offend somebody, people begin to, you know, uh, say some nasty things to us. People begin to ignore us. People begin to persecute us. People begin to offend us. Immediately we get discouraged and we do not continue in the word of God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, soil number two is supposed to be according to all the what you know what, according to the experience that we get soil number 2 is the place where the seed gets aborted in most of the christians because we are quickly offended when the word is spoken the offense is actually not for the person the offense comes because of the word because of the word that word inside of you which you have understood is now going to be tested and when that word is tested, because Satan is going to definitely bring offense against you, he's going to bring your loved one, maybe your spouse, maybe your children, maybe the people whom you love so much, they are going to say something nasty to you. And as soon as you begin to take those words, you have gone into offense and you have already aborted the seed of God's word. So the second soil is the rocky soil and we need to overcome offense to move into the third soil. And we saw that yesterday, the third soil is... When the seed fell among thorns and thistles. And you know my brothers and sisters. Because we have overcome the uh, by passing the test in soil number one and soil number two. We have got understanding and we have overcome offense. Now when the seed falls among thorns and bushes. What happens? The, the plant begins to spring. The, 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 because of the understanding and because of overcoming offense. That word is going to spring up. So this particular soil represents fighting the temptations of the world and not and, and focusing on the blessings, but now losing our focus on Jesus. And we saw yesterday that when we understand the word and overcome the offense, we are 100% ready to receive the harvest. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the moment you begin to understand the word, the moment you begin to overcome offense, you are in a ready state. Your heart is ready now to bring the harvest of the kingdom of God as long as you are faithful to the word. But you must remember one word of caution. The point we must note here is not about gaining the harvest, but continuing to receive the harvest. Please understand my brothers and sisters what I'm saying. You know, if you overcome offense and you are able to have an understanding of the word, your heart has reached a place where you are going to gain your harvest. But remember, it is not about just getting your harvest, but continuing to receive the harvest. It is not about getting your healing, but to but it be able to keep your healing and walk in divine health. It's not about being prosperous and becoming prosperous. But being able to stay prosperous, it is not about, you know, looking for a life partner, getting married, having a beautiful ceremony in the church, you know, having a great reception. But it is about having a great godly marriage. You know, my brothers and sisters, again, it is not about reaching our goal, but staying there and growing more and more to reach the full potential that God has proposed or put in your life and in my life. Please understand my brothers and sisters. God is not interested in just you reaching your summit. That's not his goal. He wants us to grow and grow because the potential that he has put inside of us is so great. The amazing potential that God has put inside you and me brothers and sisters is so great that when we begin to do what the word says, when we begin to overcome Soil number one, soil number two, and soil number three, we come to a stage where we can bear the fruit of the kingdom of God. My dear brothers and sisters, many have reached that stage where they have understood the word of God. 
they have been able to overcome the offense but listen to this the saddest part is that they have not progressed beyond the stage not because god does not want them to god is not responsible for this it is because of the third soil those who saw the blessings of god flow into their life it caused them to chase the blessings and ignore the blesser that they even forgot about the lord himself and consequently pride set in it was my social status it was the attention that i got from the world probably you know i became a film star i became someone who was very famous on television people started watching me on television and as a result of my name and fame began to spread all over the place and now instead of keeping my focus on the lord who has promoted me for his kingdom i am taking all that adulation i am taking all that praise upon myself and now i have forgotten about the lord and i have become the lord of my own life that state is a very dangerous state my brothers and sisters and as a result because of all this that happened people went away from the lord and they became fruitless in god's kingdom people became fruitless in god's kingdom even though they have an understanding of the word even though they overcame offense even though they when they, they they saw the glory of god but they got sucked into the world system and as a result they became fruitless in the kingdom of god today my brothers and sisters we are going to look at the fourth soil and this is the soil which enables you and me to bear the fruit of the kingdom of god you know my brothers and sisters let me let me let me put this thing in a proper perspective we must remember this is a process and it does not happen all at once when we just receive the lord jesus as our lord god and savior many people receive the lord jesus christ they begin to experience the the blessings of the kingdom they have understanding they are walking in love and they are all excited about the kingdom but you know what happens as soon as that understanding comes like as soon as they begin to apply the word in their life they overcome offense they are walking in love the blessings begin to flow into their life and now what happens as soon as the blessings begin to flow they have actually now become fruitless for the simple reason they have changed their focus from the lord to their blessing and you know my brothers and sisters many christians today are still drinking spiritual milk and even though there is so much put inside by the lord inside you and me it's it's it's, it's, it's become so difficult to draw it out to that full potential that god has put into them that they settle for lethargy they settle for something very mediocre and they become and they fail to become usable in the kingdom of god and therefore brothers and sisters before we talk about the fourth soil it is important to understand that in order to reach the fourth soil which is the soil where we are going to bear the fruit of the kingdom we must pass through these three stages every single person has to pass through this stage it's like you know the fourth soil is like the stage of your graduation is the stage where you are now ready to bear the fruit of the kingdom so if without going to stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 you can never reach stage 4 what has happened today is many christians are at stage 1 but they have been deceived into thinking that they are only already at stage 4 suddenly they begin to experience the lord they have got an understanding of the word of god they have understood the love of god and they already are starting to go out and start preaching the word of god and what happens when that happens somebody offends them somebody says something nasty to them somebody insults them they are all broken on the inside somebody has said something nasty to them they are so broken that they do not want to do anything with the word of god and you know my brothers and sisters by the time a person reaches to stage 4 where him you can bear the fruit of the kingdom they would have had passed the stage of understanding of the word they would have been able to overcome offense and they would be so firm in their mind that even though they have received the blessings from the lord and the blessings are pouring their focus is never away from the lord their focus is not on the blessing let the blessings come let the because you know my brothers and sisters as we saw in a previous class god always blesses not a miser god doesn't bless a person who's so selfish 
God is a person who blesses a person who is selfless, who is going to use all those blessings, not upon himself and upon only the ones who are very close to them, but he's going to use them for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And therefore, the devil is very, very, very careful. The devil is extra careful to see that Christians are going to be persecuted, that they are going to be troubled in this area of their finance. Because when a Christian or a true believer or a disciple becomes prosperous in the kingdom of God, it is going to be a big threat to the kingdom of darkness because that particular believer, that disciple of the kingdom is going to use all those resources, is going to use all the blessings, is going to use all that whatever he's receiving in order to sow into the kingdom and advance the kingdom. And you know my brothers and sisters, the more you begin to sow in the kingdom, it doesn't always have to be money. It doesn't have to be always your, you know, your physical uh, assets or resources. It could be your time. It could be your energy. It could be your talent. It could be, you know, your money. It could be everything, your house, your home, whatever is there. Whatever you have received from the Lord, you are just going to use it to advance the kingdom of God. And a person who takes such an attitude, not focusing on their blessings, not being selfish of their blessing, have passed the stage three where they don't look at their blessing as their own, but they look at it as something that has been given to them by the Lord. That's why Jesus said in, uh, in John chapter 17 verse 10, in John chapter 17 verse 10, what does Jesus say? Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, Father, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. Can you imagine the prayer, brothers and sisters? If you and I can make that prayer today, our own prayer. John chapter 17 verse number 10. Jesus is praying. He's saying, Father, all that you have is mine. And you must understand Jesus is already God, but he's still man. He's come to the earth as 100% as man. He's making a prayer to his father and he's saying, Father, all that you have is mine and all that I have is yours. If brothers and sisters, we could make that prayer our own prayer today. Father, whatever you have given me is not mine. It is yours. And whatever is yours is mine then surely we will graduate or we will pass the third stage or the third soil where we will now go into that soil where we can bear the kingdom, uh, the fruit of the kingdom of God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the reason why we don't go to the fourth soil, although we see a trickle of blessings here and there, is only because at stage three, when we have overcome the offense and we have overcome and we have begun to understand God's word, we have still got so much left to ourselves. We, we still have got that selfishness where we keep things to ourselves and we are not going to be used as stewards of the Lord to advance his kingdom. But the moment we begin to understand that when we seek the kingdom with all our heart, we are ready to advance the kingdom of God. That's the time, you know, a person who's going to be used by the Lord in order to advance the kingdom is never ever going to have any lack in his own life. A person who's a sower in the kingdom of God, who understands John 17 verse 10, is never ever going to have any lack in their life. Because when the person is being blessed, he knows that it is not his. He's only a steward of the Lord and he's going to use it to advance the kingdom of God. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when a person has passed through that stage, stage one, understanding stage two overcoming offense and stage three where even the blessings don't affect them but they are keeping their focus on the lord they reach the fourth stage wherein they are now ready to bear the fruit of the kingdom of god and with this background let us go to mark chapter 4 verse number 20 mark chapter 4 verse number 20 and these are the ones sown on the good soil they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. Now, brothers and sisters, we have seen there in that verse number 20, he says, These are the ones. Who are these are the ones? They have already passed the third stage. So they have come to fourth stage. They have passed uh, standard one, standard two, and standard three. Standard 4 is your stage of graduation wherein now you are ready for the job in the kingdom of God. You know my brothers and sisters, the good ground doesn't just happen. 
Nobody is going to reach to stage four all of a sudden. It doesn't happen overnight. There is a process, stage one, stage two, stage three. It has to be cultivated. This is the reason, my brothers and sisters, only one out of the four people in Jesus' parables brought forth fruit. Not everybody brought forth fruit. The first person did not bring forth, he did not understand. The second person did not bring fruit, he was offended. The third person did not bring fruit because the, the, the riches and the, and the excitement and all that the world offered aborted the fruit of the kingdom of God. But a person who overcame all this now reached a stage in Jesus' parable that is in Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 8. And now the person was able to bear the fruit the fruit that endures. You know, my brothers and sisters, it takes a lot of effort and a diligence to be a fruitful Christian. Let me say this again. It takes a lot of effort and diligence to be a fruitful Christian. I want to take you to, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 also talks about the same parable. It talks about the parable of the sower. And as I said to you on the first day before we began, I want you to be familiar with Matthew 13. I want you to be familiar with Luke chapter 8. And I want you to be familiar with Mark chapter 4. So we will take a passage concerning the soil that was the good soil from Luke chapter 8 verse number 15 and see what Luke writes about the fourth soil. But as for that in the good soil... These are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, when you clap all these synoptic gospels together, you will understand the parable in its complete sense. And here, this verse, verse number 15 of Luke chapter 8 is saying, it takes a lot of patient endurance. It takes a lot of patient endurance. You know, my brothers and sisters, the Christian life is not like a hundred meters dash. You know, a hundred meters dash, people, if you go to Olympics or there is this running race, a hundred meters dash can be done in anything between uh, nine seconds to about 15 seconds. And even if you are not a good runner, maybe you will finish it in 20 seconds. But it is a very quick race because the distance is very short. But the Christian life is not a 100 meters dash. The Christian life is a marathon. It's a long, enduring race. And you know, my brothers and sisters, for a Christian to become fruitful, in order for a Christian for, to become really fruitful, it is going to involve time. It involves time because unless you have gone through a process, my brothers and sisters, it is impossible, impossible to really bear the fruit of the kingdom. Remember when we spoke on the first day regarding this topic about planting the seed, I said to you, the kingdom of God operates on the principle of sowing and reaping. You sow the seed. After you sow the seed, there is a time which is a long duration about and at the end of this time, you are going to see the harvest. In the same way, brothers and sisters, the Christian life is like a marathon race. It requires endurance. It requires time in order to finish the race. Maybe you know you need to conserve your energy when you are running the marathon. If you are running at 100 meter speed for a marathon, within the next 200 meters, you will be totally drained out. You won't be able to even run on your journey. So you begin to pick up speed towards the end. You begin to train yourself. You begin to, you know, train your body in order to run a marathon. Not that when you have to run a 100 meters race, you don't train as much. But when you talk about a 100 meters race, you require all your energy, all your power for that short amount of time. You know, it's like, you know, planting this grafted plants. You know, some of the plants which, my, which our ancestors planted of coconut trees. We are eating the fruit of those coconut seeds that they had sown I don't know how many years ago we are eating that fruit now. They were not able to enjoy that fruit. But there are plants today where if you plant a coconut seed within about 3-4 years, I think they call it you know, some grafted coconuts, the height is very short. You can get the coconut fruit within about 4-5 years. Therefore, the marathon that we are talking about for a Christian is not something that you are going to start bearing the fruit of the kingdom all of a sudden overnight. 
but there is going to be a process involved, a process where you begin to graduate from stage one, stage two, stage three to reach stage four, where now your heart has become good soil to receive the incorruptible seed of God's word. You know, my brothers and sisters, it is quicker and easier to, to, to raise weeds. You know, the, the weeds that are thrown out, which are cut and thrown out, than to have a harvest of tomatoes and vegetables. Because, you know, when you have to plant vegetables and tomatoes or any particular fruit, you have to plant the seed. You have to wait for it. There are weeds growing on it. You can't just pull out the weeds. You have to wait patiently when the harvest comes so that now, along with the plant, along with that fruit plant, you can also pluck out the weeds, throw the weeds out, and now enjoy the fruit of your labor. You know, brothers and sisters, in this whole parable, which is in Mark chapter 4, or whether it is in Matthew chapter 13, or Luke chapter 8, it was the word that produced the fruit. Please understand, in, in the whole parable, it is only the word of God that produced the fruit. The ground just gave it a place to grow. If we simply put God's word in our hearts, brothers and sisters, protect it, and give it the priority in our lives, the word will produce fruit all by itself. Please understand, you don't need to sweat, you don't need to do all laboring work. You only need to take the word of God, understand it, overcome offense. You don't need to keep your focus on anything outside the word of God. Protect the word in your heart. Just protect it. Keep that word, give it the most highest priority. This word which, which you are going to protect in your heart is definitely going to bring the produce by itself. You know my brothers and sisters, Satan has deceived many Christians today into thinking that we don't have the talents, we don't have the abilities, we don't have the, we don't have the clout, we don't have the money, we don't have the education and therefore we cannot be fruitful Christians. But we are not the ones who bring forth fruit brothers and sisters. Please understand, it is not what we are that brings the fruit of the kingdom of God, but it is God's word. When we protect the word sown in our hearts, it will do the rest. It will bring the fruit of the kingdom of God. So, what made this, uh, this good ground, that soil of our heart, what made it good? Did it have more than other types of ground? What was special about the fourth soil which brought the, which brought the harvest? Was it something of a ground which was the most excellent? In fact, no, my brothers and sisters. The, the important thing we must understand between the three grounds, the three soils, first, second, and third, and the fourth soil is... There was nothing special about the fourth soil. There was nothing special about that ground. It had less of everything. It had less weeds. It had fewer rocks. It, it, to, you know, when there are less rocks, it, it's not going to drain out all the nutrition from the plant. So for our hearts to be a good ground, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take too much. It takes less. Less occupation with the things of this world and more focus on the Lord. Please understand, brothers and sisters, you are getting a secret, you are getting a revelation how to bear the fruit of the kingdom of God. Many a times Christians are deceived. They compare themselves with somebody else. Maybe somebody is sharing the word of God. Maybe somebody is a lector in the church. Maybe somebody is a Eucharistic minister. They want to go there and they also want to be a Eucharistic minister. Maybe they don't know the parish priest. Maybe they don't. They want to serve. And, and someone, nobody can tell them. Maybe they are not in a prayer group. Nobody even knows them. But in their heart, they would like to serve the Lord. And what happens, brothers and sisters? Because we have never understood this particular principle, we always look at the external, we look at the cloud, whom, whom those people know, what sort of car they drive, what sort of house they live, what sort of degrees they have, what sort of position they have in society. And accordingly, we begin to start judging people that they are better off than you and me because they are the ones whom God has chosen to serve. But you know, my brothers and sisters, when you begin to understand that in the good soil, the good soil had less of everything. It was the soil that had the least in it. And that is why when we begin to understand that in order to bear the fruit of the kingdom, that ground, that soil must have the least. It must have less weeds, less of focus on other things. It must only be focused on the word. And when somebody is committed to the word of God, that's the time God is going to bring supernaturally people into your life. God is going to use you so that his kingdom can be advanced. You know, brothers and sisters, even among those who are fruitful, listen to this very carefully. 
The word of God says, when the seed fell on, on the good soil, it gave a harvest of 30, it gave a harvest of 60, it gave a harvest of 100. So even among those who were fruitful, there were varying degrees of fruitfulness. It was not everybody who was bearing fruit was bearing the same amount of fruit, 100%. It was varying, 30, 60, 100. But this isn't dictated by the person, my brothers and sisters, who sowed the seed. It's all about the condition of the soil it was grown in. God's word, brothers and sisters, we saw that on about four or five days. That God's word is an incorruptible seed. 1 Peter 1 verse 23. Can we see that? 1 Peter 1 23 is talking about how we were made brand new in our spirit through the incorruptible seed of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. So my brothers and sisters, we have been born anew, we have been made brand new because of that incorruptible seed of God's word. And you know my brothers and sisters, this incorruptible seed of God's word, it has the same potential in every situation and every circumstance. It's, the, it's not the word that is in the, it, which, is the, which is a variable thing, but rather the condition of our heart that is receiving it. Please understand. The word will never ever compromise for anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's not different for somebody in authority and it is not something different for a person who doesn't have authority. The word of God is going to be equal for everybody because God has no favorites. God shows no partiality. If anyone is able to keep those principles of the kingdom by understanding, by not being in offense and keeping the focus on the Lord on, and not on the, on the blessings, that person is going to be a great success in the kingdom of God and really going to produce the fruit of the kingdom. You know, my brothers and sisters, this particular truth, especially when you reach to stage number four, this truth should encourage, in fact, each one of us. I'm saying this truth that, you know, the heart that really bears the fruit of the kingdom should encourage you and me. We may not have all the talents. We may not have all the abilities like other people. We may not have the clout that many people have. We may not even have the degrees and the education that others have. At the end of the day, my brothers and sisters, it is the fruitfulness that is in the kingdom of God. If you and I are going to be fruitful in the kingdom of God, having less enables us to do that because God's word is faithful and our commitment to the word of God is finally going to result in us bearing the fruit of the kingdom. Many times people think that it is the external factors that are going to help you and me in order to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Please understand, if you and I are going to bear the fruit of the kingdom, we must remember God is faithful to his word. You and I need to be committed to the word. When you put these two things together, God's faithfulness, and your commitment and my commitment to his word, that's the time we are really going to be effective. We are going to bear the fruit of the kingdom of God. There are so many people today who think based on their external situation, on their external cloud, they are the ones who are making an impact in the kingdom of God. God doesn't need you and me to make an impact. God has already done everything through his son, Jesus. And when you understand that, brothers and sisters, all that God wants you and me to do is be committed to his word. When we are committed to his word, no matter what, and we are committed to his word, and now God's faithfulness with our commitment is a wonderful combination in order to bear the fruit of the kingdom of God. So my dear brothers and sisters, as we have seen so far, the four conditions of people's heart listed in this parable present a sequence that we all have to go through. If anybody thinks that they can beat the system, surely they will never have success. You know, when, you know as I said to you uh, two days ago, if somebody wants to pass the examination, maybe it's a medical examination, a law examination, an engineering examination, just about one week, ten days before, you can mark the papers. You know, nowadays for entrance exam, they mark the papers, they go through different tests, and they go and give the examination, and they pass the examination. But in the kingdom of God, there is no shortcut. 
There is absolutely no shortcut. You cannot try to, you know, mark the papers or mark some word because at the end of the day, if your and my heart condition has not gone through the sequence or not gone through the stage one, stage two and stage three, we will never reach the stage of the fourth soil, which is the good soil to bear the kingdom of God. You know, my brothers and sisters, there is a time when God's word doesn't mean anything to us. There was a time when God's word never meant anything to us because we did not understand and the devil just came and stole the word away from us. We saw that in Matthew chapter 13 verse 19. Then we accept the word. At the end of the day, we finally accept the word. But the tribulations and persecutions offend us and we don't let the word get deeply rooted inside of our hearts which we again saw in Matthew chapter 13 verses 20 to 21. If we pass the first two challenges against God's word, then come the weeds, come the thorns. This shows a plant that took root and was growing. It could have even begun to bear fruit. In the third place, in the third soil, the person could have possibly even started bearing the fruit before he came to stage four. But brothers and sisters, again, the fruit didn't mature. This is why we must continue in the word to bear fruit and not think it is a one of activity. Many times, as I said to you, let me listen to this very carefully, my dear brothers and sisters. Many times people go to a retreat. Many times go to, go to a Bible study. They are all fired up. They are all charged up after the retreat. But what happens? Whatever they have heard, whatever they have learned, they have only put it for one or two days into practice. And because they have not been in the Word, continually in the Word, they have not been sitting under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, after about four or five days or maximum within a one week, they have absolutely forgotten everything that they learned at the retreat. It's back to life as normal. They are living a defeated life, going through the, through, through the motions of life until the next retreat comes and gives them a little bit of extra battery charge. And then they are fired up for a few days and the cycle just continues. It's like this, my brothers and sisters. In the church today, we start the, 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 the liturgical year, with, it ends with Christ the King. Then we have got the Advent. After the Advent, we go into Christmas. Then we go into Christmas, then we go into normal year. Then we go into the, uh, into the uh, Ash Wednesday. Then we go into Lent. Then we go into Easter. And year after year, we are just going into the same cycle. And if we are not able to do a self-evaluation and see how I was in my heart, how I was in my thinking last year during Christmas time, how I was in my heart in my thinking at Easter time, this year at Christmas time, have I grown in my thinking? Have I grown as a child of God? Or am I still a little baby, still being held by the hand and drinking milk, which is not, which shows that I am not really grown. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the fruit didn't mature just all of a sudden. There was a sequence. There is a time when God's word doesn't mean anything to us. But praise God, when we went through this persecution, when we went through all that, now we got rooted into the word of God. We held on. And if we pass the first two challenges, my dear brothers and sisters, then comes the weed. And that too, if we overcame, now we have matured. And that's the time we are going to bear the fruit of the kingdom. And therefore, in order to sustain that growth, in order to really be effective in the kingdom of God, bearing the fruit where you and I become disciples, and it doesn't stop with that, that now we are going out and making disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28. He said in Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20, he never told his disciples, go out to the whole world and make converts. Just baptize them with the name of the Father and of the Son. He said, go out to the whole world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, we forget the part of making disciples and we are only concerned about baptizing them and we think that they are already members of the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is far from the truth. If we begin to understand that just being baptized, we are members of the body of Christ, then we are failed to understand what really Jesus was talking in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 28. He was saying, we first need to become disciples. We need to become disciples first. 
and then we become disciples, then baptism is a culmination of that process. When we begin to believe the gospel, we believe the word of God, we have allowed it to be planted in our soil, the soil of our heart. We are beginning to bear the fruit of the kingdom. It doesn't matter when I'm baptized, but I will eventually be baptized. But just because I'm baptized doesn't make me a son or daughter of the Heavenly Father. But I need to first believe this God. I need to believe this Jesus. I need to make him the Lord and Savior and Master of my life. And that's the time I really become a child of God. Now that I've received my baptism, now that I've died with Christ and I've been raised with him, now is the time I begin to bear the fruit of the kingdom. I start walking on this earth as a disciple. I want to take you, my brothers and sisters, to John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. You know, when, when, when Jesus was talking to the Jews who were believing in him, there were many Jews. They were, they were circumcised, they were following the law. But as Jesus began to preach the word of God, many of these Jews who were following the law now began to accept Jesus and they became believers. Let us see what Jesus is telling these believers, these believing Jews, in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Just listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is not talking to the Pharisees. He is talking to the believing Jews, the Jews who believed in him. He says, if you continue in my word, please understand what is the meaning of this word. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Please understand, a disciple is not somebody who goes to church every Sunday. A disciple is not the one who has received all the sacraments. A disciple is not the only one who's got a baptism certificate to show. A, a, a disciple is not somebody who's gone and done all the seven or eight sacraments. A disciple is one who continues in my word, and continues in the word of God. And brothers and sisters, Jesus was speaking to Jews who believed on him. Yet he said that they would not be his disciples unless they continued in his word. We, we, he made a very clear distinction between those who believed and those who were his disciples. Brothers and sisters, there is a big difference. There is a big difference between the people who believed and those who were his disciples. The difference is this. In the same chapter, I believe in verse number 44, Matthew 8, 44, Jesus said those who just believed on him but would not continue in his word were the father of the devil. Can you imagine? Even those people who believed on him but did not continue in his word, they were the father of the devil. It sounds like just believing isn't enough. Can we read Matthew, uh, John chapter 8, verse number 44? You are from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, my brothers and sisters, in John chapter 8, when we start with verse number 31 and we reach verse number 44, Jesus is talking to the same believing Jews. He says to them, if you really believe in me, if you really want to be my disciples, you need to continue in the word. Then he goes to verse number 44 and he tells them, just because you are believing in me, you're not my disciples yet. He says to them, because you are not continuing in my word, you are the, you are the children of the father, you are the devil. You, you, are, you are deceived. You think that you are my disciples, but you are not my disciples. Your father is the devil. It sounds like, brothers and sisters, that just believing according to Jesus is not enough. Continuing in the word until we get free and become disciples should be the goal, not just forgiveness of our sins. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Many a times when we come to Jesus, we are very happy. We have received the sacrament of confession. We have just been forgiven of our sins. The blood of Jesus has cleaned us and we are now sons and daughters. And we feel that just because we came to Jesus, our sins are forgiven. That is true. Our sins are forgiven because we are made brand new. But listen to this, my brothers and sisters. 
Coming to Jesus is not only to be forgiveness for just for our forgiveness of our sins. We need to continue in the word until that word makes us free. And now becoming a disciple should be our goal. You know, in John chapter 8, verse number 48 and 53, these Jews who were listening to Jesus showed their true colors. I want you to read for your homework today, John chapter 8. In fact, it's a beautiful discourse between the Jews who were believing in Jesus and he was really giving them the, the, the secrets of how they could become disciples. Now, just listen to this in John chapter 8, verse 48 and 53. Can we read that, please? The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Look at these same believing Jews. They believed in Jesus. They believed that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was their Lord. And now in John chapter 8 verse 48 and 53, they are showing their true colors. You know my brothers and sisters, these particular Jews, they didn't think Jesus was any better than Abraham or any of the prophets. In fact, in John chapter 8 again, if you read from about 58 and 59, when Jesus proclaimed himself to be the great I am, they tried to stone Jesus to death. Can you imagine? These were people who really never made Jesus their Lord. They believed because they saw the miracle. They saw he was somebody special. They also said he was demon possessed. John chapter 8 verse 48 and 52. So Jesus' assessment of these people was exactly correct. He was correct about the assessment of these people because they showed that they believed, but in their heart they never believed. They believed in him to some degree, but not to the degree that they accepted Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. You know, brothers and sisters, we should follow Jesus' example. We should follow Jesus' example. He didn't pronounce those who just accept him as good and as being right with God. Please understand, just because you are a good person, you go to church, you pray, you have a nice family, you're just doing a, and just being a good person, doesn't mean that you are right with God. Many Christians today are deceived. Please understand, just being good is not good enough for the Lord. I want to take you to Mark chapter 10. You know, I'm not going to read the whole chapter in Mark chapter 10, but in Mark chapter 10, we read about the rich ruler. You know, there was a rich man who came to Jesus and he wanted to ask Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to receive eternal life? And I want to highlight what he said to Jesus in verse number 20. Listen to this, what he says to Jesus in verse number 20. Teacher, he said to him, I have kept all these since my youth. He's telling Jesus, I have kept all the laws that you have been asking me from the time of my youth. You know, my brothers and sisters, that was a big lie. This man definitely was not keeping all the rules from his youth because he had broken the very first commandment. He was so sucked up on his riches. He loved his riches. In fact, Jesus told him at the end, if you can just sell off all your goods, then come and follow me. The man, the rich man, he was downcast. He left and went. Jesus told this man to either call him God or stop calling him good. That's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 verse 18. You know, brothers and sisters, in this particular verse, that is verse number 20, this young man dropped the word good and just referred to Jesus as a teacher. This clearly shows that he was not willing to worship Jesus as God. He did not want to accept Jesus as God. He wanted to accept Jesus as some teacher, some leader, some position of authority, but he never accepted Jesus as Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, why would a person who was not willing to accept Jesus as God come to him for some instruction. Why? Why did this rich man come, come to Jesus? He was not going to accept Jesus as his Lord, God and Savior. He had just come to, you know, get some advice. It's the same reason why people come to God for help, but won't commit their lives to him. You know, brothers and sisters, this rich ruler recognized his need for more, but was unwilling to abandon himself to Jesus alone. He wanted Jesus just to encourage him for all the good he had already been doing. That's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. 
Jesus must be everything, my brothers and sisters, to us. And we cannot add or subtract anything from what he has done and think our efforts can ever make us better without Christ and his word. Please understand, if anything that we can do on our own in order to be good before God, then we have never understood what Christ has done for us. Jesus has to be accepted as God and worshipped in such a way in the heart of an individual and be made He's our own personal savior. Unless we are going to make Jesus our personal savior, brothers and sisters, it is never going to help us. True disciples are marked by the fact that they continue in God's word. We need to continue in God's word. Continuing in God's word is not something that we do occasionally. Once we go to a Bible study, or once we go to once a week to the church to hear the mass, or whatever, or go for one particular retreat. No, 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 it's not like that. Staying in God's word has to be a lifestyle, my brothers and sisters, not just something that we do occasionally. And many people have not understood this truth. Coming to God's word is not just like, you know, uh, like, like I have my breakfast, my lunch and my dinner. If I'm going to spend one hour with the word of God, I will believe that my rest of my day, the 23 hours of my day are going to be wonderful. Brothers and sisters. That's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. It has to be 24 hours of Christ and his word and not just one hour or half an hour when we think that because we have been coming to the word of God, our life is going to change. It doesn't work that way. I want to take you to verse number 32. 8, John 8 verse number 32. It says, the truth shall set us free. Can we read John chapter 8 verse number 32? And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. He says you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know what says? The first condition verse number 31 Jesus is saying if you continue in my truth then you shall be my disciples. And then he says you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Only those who continue in God's word and become disciples indeed ever know the truth. Please let me say this again. Only those who continue in God's word and become disciples indeed ever know the truth. You know, brothers and sisters, this is speaking about more than just intellectual knowledge. It's talking about more than just, you know, having head knowledge. This is talking about intimacy. It's talking about a relationship with Jesus. And that only comes with time. That only comes through our experience. It only comes through our spending time with the word. You know, brothers and sisters, it is only the truth we know that will set us free. God's word is not going to set us free. But only the word that we know, the truth that we know, and that we have already experienced it, that is going to set us free. It is incorrect to present this verse as saying God's word sets us free. Many times people say God's word will set me free. Only when we continue in it until we know it, we are now going to be set free. And unless we know the word and understand it, and therefore brothers and sisters, this brings us to the definition of a disciple. Why are we doing this particular class about planting the seed of God's word? Our ultimate goal is our journey of discipleship. So what is the definition of a disciple? A disciple is a person who continues in God's word until they experience freedom. Please let me say this again, my brothers and sisters. A disciple is a person who continues in God's word until he or she experiences freedom. So when you put together with John chapter 15 verse 8, I know John 15 is another beautiful topic where Jesus talks, I'm the wine, you are the branches. And what, what does he say in John chapter 15 verse 8? He says, when Jesus said, a disciple is one who bears much fruit. We can say that a disciple is someone who continues in God's word until they are free and can be witnesses in their life as bearing fruit in the kingdom of God. You know, my brothers and sisters, the ultimate goal as a disciple is to bear the fruit of the kingdom. And the day we begin to reach that stage four, wherein our soil of our heart has become good soil, and we are able to take the incorruptible seed of God's word, through that intimacy, through that process we have gone through, through the challenges that we have gone through against that word, now we become those people who have planted the seed of God's word in our heart to, to an extent where now because we have continued in the word, because we have known the word, we have seen the freedom in our own life. 
we can go out and share the word with others and bring them into a relationship with Christ. And that is what the job of a true disciple is. A disciple is one who is going to advance the kingdom of God and bring others also into that intimacy and that relationship with Jesus. Amen? So let us pray, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for giving us the understanding of this fourth soil. The soil where we finally become disciples, where we begin to bear the fruit of your kingdom. Lord, it is not the, just the word that sets us free. Yes, it's true. Your word is an incorruptible seed. But it is, Lord, our heart condition, the soil of our heart, which is free from all the weeds. It is free from all the offense. It has got perfect understanding. And when we have gone through this process, your word, for which you are always faithful, and our commitment to that word, a combination which makes us disciples and brings us to being fruitful in your kingdom. Today, Lord, as we understood this word, help us, Lord, on this journey of discipleship to, become, to begin to bear the fruit of your kingdom, not to be impatient, not to be uh, upset when things are getting delayed, but allowing the Holy Spirit to take the time in preparing our hearts. We cooperating with the Holy Spirit in order to make our hearts good soil so that when this word enters our hearts and we get committed to it, we guard the word in our hearts and we bring the fruit, a fruit that is going to last and bring success and advancement in your kingdom. For this great privilege, Lord, that you have given each one of us in order to bear the fruit of your kingdom, the opportunity in order to be used as your ambassadors, as your instruments to bring souls into the kingdom. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.